Today, we're, as Ben said, we're going to have a look at uh, uh, content management techno uh, technology trends. Uh, I will start with a very short presentation to describe the main trends we are seeing uh, in managed from an IABM research perspective. And then we will delve into a discussion with Pixel and Oyala on this part of the content chain. But let's start having a look at uh, some of the main drivers of change in, uh, in manage. In this part of the content chain, like in other parts of the uh, content supply chain, media technology users are striving to move to a media factory uh, approach to be more efficient when delivering content to uh, multiple platforms. And to do so, end users are increasingly leveraging uh, the potential of data, including metadata, but also operational data and audience data to drive decision making uh, and uh, maybe more importantly, uh, automation of routine workflows. Some end users told us that they see themselves as data companies going forward, and this is particularly important uh, in this part of the content chain. Uh, also, cloud is, uh, is impacting this part of the content chain with end users demanding more flexibility and also collaboration in content preparation and uh, management workflows. Other trends that we see as relevant include the increasing reliance on microservices with uh, some end users including increasingly building solutions by themselves in order to address uh, uh, new challenges. This is the data that we have on the most important drivers of technology demand in manage. And as you can see, the focus is on automating workflows and mostly routine workflows in content preparation, such, such as metadata tagging. The rise of uh, emerging technologies such as uh, machine learning is of course uh, helping with that. The second most important uh, driver of technology spending is uh, multi-platform delivery as increasingly content management systems need to account for the rising number of platforms they need to deliver content to. Finally, virtualization, including cloud and microservices, as we said, is the most important, uh, the third most important trend. And we will discuss, of course, all these topics during the panel too. So now let me introduce uh, our panelists. Today we are joined by Bea Alonso, uh, Director of uh, Global Product Marketing at Oyala, and Kristen Bullet, uh, Co-Managing Director of Pixel. Thank you very much for being with us today. Hey, Lorenzo, how are you? Thank you for having me. Thank you. Hey, Lorenzo. Hi. Uh, so let me start from you, Bea, uh, and let me start from the very general. What do you see as the main drivers of uh, change in, in manage from Oyala's perspective? Yeah, so from our viewpoint, the kind of conversations we're having with our clients, it's very interesting to see how they've evolved over the last 10 years or so. Um, you know, right now, it's all about moving the content supply chain to the cloud and, and how to kind of become those media factories that your reports talk about quite clearly. So, you know, looking at moving investment from CapEx to OPEX um, and, and often around what parts of the content supply chain can be already deployed in the cloud and whether to have a kind of big bang approach or, or move uh, through different processes and components. So that's kind of probably top of the agenda when we talk to our customers around managing content. Um, and of course, very linked to that is automation, speed, efficiency. And, and again, on, on the graph that you were showing, that's the top, probably one of the top technology trends right now and in terms of purchasing drivers, um, because competition is so fierce these days to deliver content to more platforms and more viewers, that one of the few ways that you can really increase uh, or kind of sense that competition is by automating and, and becoming more efficient and delivering more content in less time or with less resources. And finally, one another trend that I see a lot in Manage is security. Um, I'm pretty sure we'll talk about security at some point today, but you know, the ability to make sure and, and, and manage content in a way that is safe and, and in, in no way is disclosed before the time that it, it needs to be delivered. 
Yeah, especially with all the investment that is going uh, into content now. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Christian? I, I would certainly agree with all of those points. Um, certainly cloud migration is a very prominent piece here. I think yeah. there's a natural point of architectural refresh, which is catalyzed by the convergence of broadcast and OTT. Um, but I think both of those things combined with a threat from the FANG companies um, is pushing major media organizations to have a real desire to understand what is happening within their organizations. I, I think a confluence of all of those things is really pushing that change forward. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so competition for you is important in, uh, uh, in making them want to be more efficient. And uh, um, you've done, uh, Chris, done a lot of work on, on data and more specifically the metadata. Sorry, um, in order to power more uh, efficient content uh, management workflows, uh, what are the challenges that some of your customers are facing when it comes to leveraging the, the full potential out of their data? So I touched on natural architectural refresh and yeah. I also mentioned the fan companies. So there's a clear threat from the Netflixes and the Amazons of the world and there's certainly a drive to compete against those, as you said. But then if I look at traditional media organizations, they have spaghetti architectures. They've got a lot of things in there that they, they desire to fix um, amongst those architectural issues. Um, it's a huge challenge. And as, a, as an organization, if you're trying to compete at the same time as trying to deal with historical uh, architectural complexities, th there's a real, there's, there's a real challenge there. Um, yeah. A lot of that's driven by lack of interoperability across platforms. I think we certainly used to come from a world of closed APIs, lack of standards, lack of common identifiers, yeah. and that further exacerbates the spaghetti architecture challenge. I think that focus to, we need to copy Netflix. We need to do what they're doing because that threat has become so, so right now and in your face that looking at a financial and budgetary perspective, that's where the focus is. How can, how can a large media organization go back and look at fixing some of those historical problems when the need is to compete against the Netflix and that's very consumer facing. Yeah. Um, and, and again, you know, I need to look at the financials there. There's a continued drive to cut costs. Now, Bea mentioned that before, but it's all well and good making a statement like I need to cut costs. But if you don't understand what your existing platform is doing, what your existing data's purpose is, then it doesn't really help you move forward with a common and clean understanding of, of that landscape. Okay, okay, that's interesting. And, and, and yeah. I, I just wanted to Please. touch up on that real quick. And I couldn't agree more with Kristen on the point about you need to understand how you work today in order to analyze where those cost efficiencies can be made. But back to your spaghetti infrastructure and architecture and, and the legacy systems, and especially for companies that have been doing this or they've been in this business for decades, there is such a baggage to deal with, right? It's not so easy to look at where cost savings or efficiencies could be implemented. I think this is a recurrent theme for us and some of our customers, which interestingly doesn't happen for new starts because you know, we, we start fresh, there's a new environment or a new platform to be set, and, and we can look at best practices and lessons learned from before. Um, so yeah, I mean, at some point, if we have time, we can talk about how, how to make those uh, legacy setups or legacy practices more efficient uh, going forward. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I, I don't want to, to link to that, uh, uh, also, because uh, Netflix, of course, uh, is, a, is a technology company, has developed uh, a lot of technology uh, by itself. And we talk to a lot of end users and they tell us that uh, data is very important for them uh, and they want to, uh, they see data, as I said before, uh, strategic investment. And, so, and some of them, they want to work in-house for that. So, Bea, I, want to, I wanted to touch on that as well, because Manage is the art of the content chain and uh, st of course a strategic investment for media organization uh, 
this trend of uh, in-house investment, so with more end users investing in uh, uh, in-house development projects, do you see uh, as a vendor, do you see this as a threat or as as an opportunity to further collaborate with your customers? And of course, Chris, then feel free to to jump in later as well. Yeah, and and I would be interested to hear Kristen's view as well. But from our viewpoint, uh, we have a fairly open architecture with APIs and, and a full SDK, which means that we don't always have to provide um, all of our tool set. I mean, we in yeah. fact provide a platform that clients can build onto. So, you know, that at least they have that backbone that underpins whatever user tools they want to have. I often hear that the issue when a company needs to buy an asset management environment, for example, is that it doesn't exactly do what they need, that there's always something that is not quite there, which is why often they end up building their own. Yeah. Um, but probably that, and, and we all know, that's not always the most efficient way of doing it because the day that the team that develops that application goes away or, or kind of moves on, then you're left with legacy that is hard to maintain. Yeah. Um, so in, in answer to your question for us, we often don't see this as a threat um, because what we provide is the backend environment as well as a set of tools that if the tools are not what the client wants, we provide the workflow orchestration and the base architecture to build on top. So we've got kind of a, a hybrid between build yeah. or buy. Yeah. So you give them the, the, the possibility. Yeah. The, the yeah. We, we have a number of clients that said, look, we have already our own user interfaces, but what we need to do is orchestrate different stages of the managed process. Yeah. Um, so we've provided them what we call a headless environment. Um, which hardly, I mean, end users do not operate our own user interfaces. That's it. There is just a back end with a. Oh, sorry. I, I think I, I, you lost me there. There's just oh, no the problem. back end. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Vea. No, that's very interesting. Uh, Kristen, do you have any, um, uh, anything to say on, on this BIY trend, which is, uh, uh, very hot at the moment, especially manage. So, so I have a, I have slightly opposing views on this. I think on the one hand, I'd be yeah. quite foolish and say, look, as a large media organization, you should absolutely focus on your strengths. And yeah. yes, there's a continued trend of large media organizations building out their own dev shops, but what should the focus of those dev shops be? And I think the focus should be on content and user yeah. experience and enabling that you push the right content to the users and you can support reduction of churn and individualizing your offering. Um, and I'm, I absolutely mean that respectfully. Um, but yeah. I also look at the building, the, the DIY building of back end platforms. A lot of aspects of that are already commoditized. And I think there's a real opportunity there to, to work cohesively together. And they mentioned uh, providing a headless set of services. I also look at things like microservice architectures. Um, yeah. Can organizations do a pick and mix approach? And if we can provide good interoperability, work against common standards, work against common toolings and uh, libraries, then we could take a microservice approach of, actually, we can absolutely complement what you are doing and building through your homegrown solutions. And we can also look at the commercial perspective of that. We provide a SaaS platform and we are on a, on a OPEX model and that can be very granular. So you can pay for what you use and you can pick and choose the aspects at which you use through that microservice architecture. There's a lot of flexibility there. Um, selfishly, of course, I'd like to build everything, but that's not the reality of the world. Yeah, yeah, because they, 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 from my perspective, you should focus on content. No, that's a... That's great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, but I wanted to move to another topic, which is uh, which I mentioned before, and uh, it's AI, uh, especially in managed going forward. Uh, what is real and what is up hype around uh, AI managed from your perspective? Uh, and how do you see AI augmenting your offerings and helping your customers uh, automate more routine workflows? Yeah, and I think I think we all accept that AI and ML is a very well used set of terms and yeah. uh, everybody has different interpretations of them. I, yeah. love, I love some of the sexy POCs 
that are built on AI for augmented experiences, for creation of metadata that you can, uh, you can build into your end user applications and therefore you can push adverts or you can push more content to people. It's all sexy, it's all interesting, it's all fun. But I think the real opportunity surrounds cost savings. How can you reduce traditionally manually heavy tasks to facilitate flexibility and agility. So enabling organizations to do more, to do it faster, and to do it cheaper. That's the, that's the top of an interesting application for me. Um, I look at things such as automated enrichment of metadata versus uh, the traditional approach, which is let's put things in a spreadsheet, let's get some manual operators to go out there and select the right content from a different spreadsheet and manually merge it back into a central piece before it gets ingested and pushed out to your uh, consumer platforms. Um, or automated analysis of content. Let's look at an example such as a post-broadcast WOD offering. If I'm, a, yeah. if I'm an ad-supported broadcaster, there are, I, I'm sure we've all seen where they leave the adverts hard, hard baked into the asset and you're watching adverts that have been baked into the broadcast stream. Why, why can't we use automation to correctly identify where those adverts are when we can't rely on scutty markers, for example, and we can intelligently switch those out? You know, these are all traditional manual tasks that today people are using pen and paper to write down time codes before they push that information into whatever their stitching tool is. All of that is right for automation with AI. Yeah, interesting. So it's about cost savings, but it's it's about beer, uh, being um, quicker as well. It's about more speed as well if you're automated. Is it also a driver of efficiency, you, you think, in broadcast media organizations? Yeah, and I think, I think the efficiency point leans towards that. Everybody wants to produce and distribute and deliver more content. More content, yeah. Oh, great. Um, uh, but I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, ML as well, because uh, uh, some brokers, we've seen some broadcast media organization interest in the potential of uh, AI as a tool for content preparation as well, uh, not just data tagging. Uh, are you seeing interest in that as well, even if we've uh, focused more on the cost savings uh, for now? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're at the point at the moment with AI and, and ML generally where we're trying to find, not we, but generally the industry is trying to find ways of maximizing its use and, and what sort of new use cases can we find for it. And what I've, he what I've been hearing in the last six to 12 months is things like, you know, suggestions for, for editing when, when you sit down in front of your editing bins and you're going to either create, as you say, a sports package or highlights, um, you know, for it, it would be great for an AI package to be able to, to sift through um, all of the stock footage that we've got today for that particular piece and kind of yeah. play content in the bin or in the timeline uh, intelligently, I'm going to say, so that that you, you kind of save time and save um, that, that you gain that speed on creating the sports highlights. Now, very specifically to do with sports highlights, we've been working um, with Teravolt, uh, which, as you know, grabs statistics from uh, sports in events and then creates, it, it, we obtain the time codes from Teravolt and using those time codes, then we automatically generate uh, highlights and, and then based on pre-configured workflows, those are delivered to different endpoints. That's actually not an AI application. What we no. are doing is kind of automating existing data, not too dissimilar to what Kristen was saying. You know, if you've got that data somewhere and you don't have to use a pen and paper and a spreadsheet, then that's something that you can automate. I, I have a little bit of an issue in the way that AI is being used to call all sorts of processes that you know, years yeah. ago, we would have just called automation anyway. Um, and, and the other kind of application in content preparation that I've been hearing about, but I think we're not quite there yet, is restoring content in advance from an archive. So if you're going to cover, if you work in news and you're going to cover a story around hurricanes, you know, it would be ideal if we had a package that goes back to the archive environment and picks up the, the last 
in the last three years of hurricanes and then automatically updates it for uh, restores it for you and is ready for you to work on when it comes to preparing the, the news story. So, create, yeah, there, there are creative discussions around it. How close are we to that happening? I, I, I'm not convinced. I'm kind of always sitting on the fence with AI because I have actually seen some of the results um, we do in, integrate with a number of AI solutions out there, and I'm always left a little bit neutral because I feel that until we have more accuracy in terms of capturing metadata or transcribing, for example, yeah. I feel the the use is it's uh, up to a percentage, but not a hundred percent there yet. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Uh, you talked about our crazy, so uh, Christian, uh, to, to achieve that, uh, and users need to, to get their, their data uh, right, uh, don't they? Uh, we, we talked a little bit about this as well uh, before, but I wanted to come back on, on, on it. Uh, what, what are some of the challenges uh, your, your customers are going through when, when, it, comes to, when it comes to data, when ma making sense of all this data, especially as they go direct to consumer as well? So, so in, in relation to the challenges, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's many different silos of information. Yeah. And how do, you, how do you make sense of that information? And um, it's not just the informational perspective. I, previously, Bear mentioned the, uh, the CapEx problem. Um, I look at that transition from CapEx to what? I think some of the business-led problems are quite significant here. Yeah. Um, but but from a from a data perspective, I think I think looking at multiple silos of information, an inability to make relationships across that is, is an absolute challenge for us here. And additionally, being able to get the data right and put it in a good place, using AI then to build upon that. That's a natural following point to be doing that. And it's a bit of a cart before the horse situation. Certainly, I talked about sexy POCs. There's a, there's a, a drive to let's do this fun, interesting stuff rather than let's really fix the data we have today. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's, that's great. Uh, you, you talked about a couple to topics, and of course, we need to talk about uh, cloud that we, you've already mentioned, Bea. How, how do you see the adoption of the cloud in this part of the industry? You mentioned it before, but uh, uh, what do you think are some of the challenges that uh, users uh, are still experiencing when deploying cloud-based systems in managed specifically? Mm, so probably number one is, is, I'd say, a lack of understanding or a lack of clarity. Um, yeah. You know, when somebody wants to look at moving stages of the supply chain over to the cloud, it is yet not 100% clear how much that's going to cost. Um, and, and someone mentioned to me the other day, you know, X vendor charges you for just sneezing at the screen sort of thing. You know, right now, it's not totally transparent how much, there's so one thing is to host the the different stages of the chain or the, or the management of the content. But of course you call egress and, and you have to store. And depending on different demand and peaks and troughs, your, your costs are gonna change. So I think it's very difficult today still to have a good projection. Whereas when you had your CapEx investment, that, that was a lot clearer year to year. You knew, yeah. you knew the sort of investment that you had at, at the beginning plus a number of years projection, and that was fairly clear. Today, not clarity around cloud investment, I think is probably one of the areas that makes it a bit more difficult to adopt. Secondly, skills. Um, the industry is still going through that transition from broadcast engineers, um, the folks that would always have a, a screwdriver at hand, um, and, and that's a skill that's probably needed less and less these days versus that difficult mix between a broadcast engineer and an IT engineer. So someone that, uh, who's able to understand both technologies. Um, and, and I hear quite regularly from some of our customers that that's a tricky 
uh, conundrum to, to resolve because recruiting people who can understand these new models of doing business, a more SaaS-driven uh, offerings, it's not so easy in the industry today. So, okay. so that's what I'm hearing. Okay, so economics uh, in terms of uh, pricing as well and skills. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, uh, those two give, uh, give you opportunity for, uh, for you as well to, to help them, educating them a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah. What yeah, do you indeed. think? Just, yeah, I can just yeah please. The, the point on CapEx versus OpEx and, and transition to that operational model, I think that one's particularly interesting because in my experience, and I think we can probably give credit to AWS for this, a lot of the technical conversations I have, it, there is a complete understanding of the, op the, the, the OpEx model, there's a complete understanding of you pay for what you use against services, and I think a lot of the technical conversational battles are won in that respect. People are on board with it. And then it goes to the CFO or it goes to someone in finance and procurement are suddenly saying, we need to wrap our budget around this, which is exactly the point that they made before. Um, and then that's a whole different conversation of, I think a subset are getting a clarity or an understanding of this, but then I believe when we look at the financial aspects, that's the next part that needs to catch up. Okay. So it's uh, just to, uh, the, again, the economics and um, the financial part of it, which is interesting. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then that, that, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Um, I was going to touch on a point of earlier on, uh, Lorenzo, you talked about organizations uh, creating and owning their data. I do think there's a, under, there's a, there's a, a concern about losing control of their data and okay. losing control of their data centers. But that also is combined with a data sovereignty concern. Now we know there's, uh, there's legislation that says in places like Germany, user information has to be stored in country. But yeah. I think it's an exacerbated issue of, I don't want my data to be stored in Ireland or the US. And it's more of a, a philosophical or an emotional thing sometimes as well. Okay. No, interesting point as well. But, uh, Bea, do you want to add some, something as well on this? Yeah, not too unrelated to what Kristen just said. You know, data and owning and control is security. Um, we are being asked more and more to provide evidence that if we are going to host an environment, if we are going to provide a SaaS service, that we comply with a number of cybersecurity requirements. And, and of course, when... Uh, in the past, you didn't have to worry about uh, implementing solutions in, on the, in the cloud or everything was mostly on-premise based. That, that was not necessarily as much as a concern as it is now. So I think, you know, in the, in the discussion around what, what, is, what, what are the concerns in adopting cloud supply chains, I think security is I think we're addressing it as, a, as an industry, but uh, it's certainly a conversation point that comes up much more these days in, in, in our discussions with clients. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually, according to our data as well, security is the top concern for media companies still when, when moving to the cloud. Uh, one, one other thing I wanted to link to this uh, uh, for you, Bea, is uh, uh, with the cloud, uh, uh, managers becoming increasingly more integrated with uh, other parts of the content chain, for example, produce and, uh, and publish. Uh, do you see your customers demanding a more integrated approach from you? And how are you addressing this? Um, actually, I think this is an interest, well, interesting one because either we, we, we always see the requirement for more openness, um, more, more partners, um, and uh, in our go-to-market approach, this is exactly what we, what we want to offer, the ability to, we're not interested necessarily in delivering the end-to-end -end solution for, uh, some, somebody said to me once, I don't want a vendor that addresses end-to-end -end everything. Um, so for us, I think we prefer to work with clients that understand that there are best of breed vendors for the different stages of yeah. the content supply chain. 
um, and we provide that glue that orchestrates and helps and, and through the openness and the ecosystem um, that's that's the sort of uh, philosophy that, that we have. Now, that's not to say that there are not clients out there that say, well, look, um, I want to work with a vendor that provides me with all of the pieces of the puzzle because I don't have the bandwidth or the technical expertise to go and do this myself. Um, but I think it really depends on the skill sets that they have in-house. Yeah. Um, and the ability to do system integration uh, themselves too. Yeah, yeah, oh, interesting. Uh, Christian, coming back on the cloud, of course, uh, uh, Brook is a media organization and going to uh, an immense business transformation with all this data, the, the cloud, and uh, some of them, uh, we are also resistant to change and might adopt a more gradual uh, approach to change while they might need uh, a more radical transformation of their workflows to to catch up also with uh, with the competition do you see this trend as well I, I think this is a really interesting point um, you talked about the produce and the published parts of the content chain before but I think there are lots of conversations that are looking at large-scale digital transformation projects yeah bring everything together, but this is very hard. Digital transformation is hard at scale, and it involves many stakeholders, it involves cross-organizational commitment, it involves significant budget. Um, and this naturally trends to being a slow um, process. And I think that is, that is the ambition, but certainly let's tear up those playbooks, let's tear up those run books and see how we can approach this holistically as an organization. But it's really challenging, and I think we need to be we need to be careful that we don't pretend to have all the answers as a as a supplier. Yeah. But I think we have to help tra be transformative in organisations, and support conversations, share that cross organisational knowledge. So organisations sometimes do struggle to speak to different people in that same organisation, and we need to look at interoperability standards. Uh, and ultimately contribution effectively to that change. Yeah, yeah. So being honest and bold at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, a last question to both of you, uh, because we talked a lot about manage and of course is a strategic investment, as we said, for uh, broadcast and media organization, but this has brought a lot of competition in your segments too with uh, new companies uh, uh, entering uh, manage as well. Uh, how are you dealing with that uh, and how do you manage to stand out in our crowded marketplace starting from you Christian? I think I think Pixel have learned quite a lot of lessons as we've gone through this journey. Yeah. Um, I think I think I would address Pixel but I'd probably address everyone with the first three thoughts on this. Don't don't try and do everything. Know your strengths. Yeah. <laughs> I think you need to ensure openness transparency and interoperability. I think they're very, very key. And then I think you need strong supply of partnerships, which ultimately allow simpler approaches to vendor selection. Okay. Um, I, I, look at, I look at Pixel and what do I think? I think we see, and I believe our customers see that metadata is the lifeblood of an organization. And that's where significant change needs to start. But that's, that's Pixel's focus. Fix your understanding of your metadata and the rest will follow. Yeah, okay, great. Bea? Yeah, I, I was kind of smiling when, um, when Kristen was saying, don't try to do everything. How absolutely right he is. Um, when a vendor tries to do everything, it just, it just doesn't work out because you can't do everything well. Um, and sometimes I look at some vendors in this space some of them compete with, with what we do at Uyala. And, and I kind of scratched my head thinking, how can they offer 67 products and, uh, and all of those 67 products do the right stuff? Um, so I, I think there is a lot of uh, marriage in, as Kristen say, says, focus on what you do well and do it well and deliver it well, and then you will have satisfied customers. Um, our focus at Uyala is around partnering with our clients. So rather than a 
transactional kind of relationship you know we understand that that the industry is in transition and as we were saying earlier some of our clients are going through a transformation that is actually quite difficult internally for them so it is it's often around being able to change the goalposts which happens a lot and and managing that transition well so when we uh, enter a relationship with a client, it's almost as, as a partnership where we have an, an ultimate goal that um, that is to drive that customer to the success that they looking to achieve with that with that project. And if there is a need to change the project uh, throughout the implementation, then that is something that that we are fairly used uh, to doing. Um, so. Just to kind of reiterate some of the points that Kristen made around openness and flexibility and having a open relationship with the customer. Uh, we've, uh, we've done um, a lot of letting their engineers talk to our engineers so that they can speak at the same level and ultimately achieve the solution that the client wants. No. Um, the other thing that, that we are looking at doing going forward is kind of more pointed solutions. So again, not this end-to-end -end everything, but serving very specific use cases because <clears throat> sometimes there's an easier fix than trying to redesign a whole content supply chain. So, um, you know, when we sit to have a conversation with a client, perhaps they're saying, look, we, we're not too sure where to start. We know that we want to modernize our supply chain, but it's just a conundrum today. So we try to unpick a particular use case, could be delivery to licensed partners or increase your syndication requirements or you know, automate a specific workflow that is focused on restoring archive content. And that has really helped us be a bit more nimble in terms of implementation and delivering quickly. And then grow from there is necessary. So. Uh, yeah, and, and again, as Kristen says, having been in the industry for a number of years certainly teaches you a lot. And often you have to adapt your, your uh, direction because the industry is changing so fast anyway. What you thought was going to be your roadmap for the next 18 months, especially that's, it's not going to happen. You know, roadmaps need to change and adapt and the demands of our clients are so dynamic that the way that roadmaps used to be done when you were a software company in the past has, has completely gone out of the window. So yeah, yeah, yeah. remaining dynamic is really important today. No, great. And it, I'm glad we finished on uh, best to breed. So being focused and also on collaboration, both uh, between vendors, but also between vendors and customer, which I think are two very big teams uh, in, in the industry, as you said at the moment. Uh, Ben, I think we are ready to take any questions. Yeah, thank you, Lorenzo. So, um, um, we've got a question here for you, Kristen. Uh, you talked about data and getting it right. Are any of your customers leveraging data for prediction, or is that part not developed yet? Uh, one of our customers is using their viewing data and correlating that against their title information. Um, that's more from a how do I promote and recommend titles to end viewers? We, um, from a cloud scaling perspective, we use the consumption information to be able to predictively scale. Um, an example of that would be looking at something like sports events. So if I know a sports event is coming on, we can pre-scale because we know there's going to be a thundering herd of requests of uh, requests for that information. We have not yet put predictability against the metadata and introduced more AI into that. that, that I think that will be an interesting thing to say, uh, how do I take efforts to be more uh, automated in generation of metadata? Um, and the thing I'm looking at that is you could do things Personalized synopsis. I know people who do personalized synopses, but that could, that's certainly an opportunity to do something in a more predictive fashion. Interesting. 
Okay, question. Thank you for that. Uh, Bea, we've got a question for you here. Um, Uyala has recently signed a deal with the French Football League for the launch of its OTT platform. Do you see more of this type of organisations going direct in the future? Um, absolutely. We, it's very interesting because we have seen an, a, a really increased demand from sporting organisations um, to take control since we were talking around about control, to take back ownership for their own content and actually design their own video strategy to reach their fans and go direct to consumer. Um, this started for us probably about two years ago with the National Rugby League of Australia. They were real visionaries. Um, I remember they, the very first meeting I had with them, you know, we were talking to a digital team who really wanted, they wanted to take control of the content, all of the broadcast um, rights and deliver everything themselves to either digital platforms through subscriptions uh, and, and to all of their clubs. Um, and at the time I thought, wow, this is a bold move. Um, not too sure how successful it will be. Two years later, they're even selling their photography through our, the, we manage all of the photography from the professional photographers that take photos of each of the matches and then that's put on a portal for anyone who actually wants to pay and download high resolution of those photographs. So that's how far they've gone in monetizing their own content. So LSP is another example. We're working with Arsenal, who's been our customer for a long time. Um, and all of these sporting teams, leagues, um, organizations are actually um, realizing that the content they hold can be um, a great way of engaging more fans because um, you know you've got your own video strategy you can um, deliver more content through your website increase the number of uh, subscriptions and 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 offer merchandise through all of that video subscription too so uh, yeah absolutely the LSP is not going to be an, an isolated uh, example of, of, of that so yeah very much so Okay, Bea, well, thank you very much. Um, so we haven't got any other questions, so I'd just like to thank Lorenzo, Bea and Kristen for taking the time to talk to us today. Um, and thank you all for joining us as well.